Good morning. Two weeks left for packing shoe boxes, so uh, Sunday the 24th will be the last day to leave a box, pick up a label, put your tag on your box, and drop it off at the back table there. Um, we had a, a service of prayer and focus on the persecuted church. Uh, back there with the Voice of the Martyrs magazine, which in that magazine is a pull-out map that you can like, even have your family see all the countries of the world that are either restricted access, uh, where they wouldn't let intentional missionaries in, uh, or at least hostile to missionaries, and you'd see how vast the, the, the globe is covered by those two categories. Um, it, it, to think of the number of Christians that are in countries that aren't friendly towards their religion is astounding. Um, some of you may be helped by, there's an eight-minute DVD. Uh, there's probably six or seven of these maybe left on the table, maybe fewer than that. Um, it's just a short video about believers in North Korea uh, and what it would be like to have any copy of God's Word as a North Korean and the risk that would be. So if you want to pick one of those up, you can take it and bring it back and set it there when you're done with it or hand it to someone else. But I want you to know those are available. It's also, I think, online at Voice of the Martyrs. Uh, if you're not on their mailing or email, it would probably be helpful for you to at least get their magazine in the mail uh, or get the email that just would keep your eye on not just world events, but world events as they very specifically affect uh, fellow believers. We're told in Colossians to remember those who are in chains, um, and certainly then obedience would demand some part of our attention given to uh, the global church and especially those that are persecuted. Elementary children, um, and by age, I mean 12-year-olds, if you could help us with the children's choir down to two or three, whatever you're comfortable with your child learning to sing uh, and not thoroughly embarrassing you when they stand up in front of everyone to sing, uh, turn them loose, uh, send them downstairs to the youth room. They've got the keyboard set up. They'll be learning their song. And this will kind of be a standing practice in this next month, building up towards the Christmas season, so children, right after the service, a lot of you head downstairs anyway, uh, will funnel you into the room to do some singing in there. Uh, a quick glance at the weather gives us a beautiful day today to enjoy a fall, but do be careful overnight. It looks like it could be a little interesting. Um, and so let me use that to remind you regarding weather announcements. Um, right now, it'll primarily be email. We'll keep developing uh, maybe a better format for contacting you, but uh, anytime you have weather concerns on Sunday, one, use your discretion. You will be the one driving or riding, so uh, we will certainly understand if you're not here if we decide to have a service. Two, check your email. Uh, we'll try to send out an email generally around 8 o'clock at the latest. Three, just call if you have any question. Uh, and think you want to drive, but want to make sure we have a service. Uh, and then four, just be aware that it might be standard practice to at least cancel the Sunday school hour to give us time just to clean off sidewalks or something. So that, just a few thoughts regarding bad weather on Sundays. Last year, uh, I think we missed a whole month. Uh, I think there were four times at least that we didn't have a service. Um, and so we're trying to figure out a little better plan to be equipped and ready for having the place available to you. Um, but God gave us a place on a great hill, so we, we want to be mindful of, of that uh, coming this winter weather. All right, let's turn our attention to worship. It's good to have you here. We'll be studying the hope that is ours in the resurrection. Uh, last week it was, what if Christ didn't rise from the dead? And it kind of led us down a path there of all the problems that are ours if Christ hasn't been raised. And yet today we see the great alternative to that, why we can have hope, because he has been raised from the dead. Here's Psalm 50. It reminds us in this season of thanksgiving of our duty to give God the thanks that he is due. Psalm 50 and verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Perhaps even before I pray, you'll make a sacrifice of thanksgiving. 
Let's not make it overly spiritual. Let's just offer a sacrifice with our prayer of thanksgiving. So let's pray together. And in the first moment, why don't you pray thanking God for something? We'll enter into his gates with thanksgiving this morning. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would be pleased with the prayers of your people, these offerings, sacrifices of thanksgiving. In the Old Testament sacrifices, the aroma would fill the tabernacle. And so we want the sacrifice of our thanks and praise to be a sweet-smelling savor to you. We want you to know that we know and we believe and we trust in you as a God who is for us, who does good to us, who has our lives in your hands, the God who gives us everything that we need, who gives us grace to endure all things that you give us. And we certainly want to be thankful people we want to be reminded, even as our nation focuses on a season of thanksgiving, uh, all the more as your people, as a holy nation, we want to be those who are thankful. <clears throat> Help us. Maybe in the quiet moment of this prayer, even, we were bombarded with all the reasons not to be thankful, all the cares of the world, all the pressures and problems of our lives, Oh, Lord, give us faith to be a thankful people through all of that. And so we come before you with thanksgiving, with praise, reminding ourselves of who you are, of what you've done for us. And we're grateful that you've not left us on our own, but you've rescued us. You are redeeming us and ours is cause for great hope this morning because our Savior, crucified, is also risen again. And so, hear the praise of your people. Bless us as we sing to one another and to you as we open your word. Uh, make us an obedient people. Uh, we've gathered in your name, in the name of Jesus. Uh, let us rejoice in it even as we pray in it. Amen. Let's stand together as we lift our voices to the Lord.
We have two scriptures to read this morning, and the first one is Leviticus 23, starting in verse 9 and going through 14. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, when you enter the land I'm going to give you and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain you harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a lamb, a year old without defect, together with its grain offering of one gallon of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quart of wine. You must not eat any bread or roasted new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come, wherever you live. Then the next passage is Numbers 28, 26 through 31. On the day of first fruits, when you present to the Lord an offering of new grain during the festival of weeks, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. Present a burnt offering of two young bulls, one ram, and seven male lambs a year old as, a rom- as an aroma pleasing to the Lord. With each bull there is to be a grain offering of one and a half gallon of the finest flour mixed with oil. With the ram, one gallon, and with each of the seven lambs, two quarts. Include one male goat to make atonement for you. Offer these together with their drink offerings in addition to the regular burnt offering and its grain offering. Be sure the animals are without defect. Go to the Lord in confession this morning. Merciful Father, we come to you with the need of confession on our hearts and minds. We have sinned this week and we failed to honor you in all that we've done. Even the best among us would have to admit that we have failed to love you with all of our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths this week. We certainly not loved our neighbor as ourselves. And we find ourselves often hard hearted, whether it be towards others, towards your word, the prompting of your spirit, the praise that we should be offering as our reasonable gift to you. Lord, we've often just thought of nothing but the next task in front of us or that next goal we wanted to accomplish, or even otherwise good things that may be for our families, things that we want to do, but often failing to consider you in the process. So Lord, forgive us for not taking time to praise, not taking time to worship in spirit and in truth, going through the motions often singing familiar songs without ever considering the meanings of the words. Forgive us, Lord, when we've turned worship into just an exercise like getting up and brushing teeth or hair, when worship has become mundane in our hearts and we've become hard-hearted. So, Lord, as you forgive, soften our hearts Remind us again that all that we have, all that we enjoy, and the many pursuits that we, that we strive for, they all come from you. You've been the generous father 
that's poured out so much on us, even by virtue of allowing us to live in this time and in this place, you've been far more generous with us than most of your saints in history. And so, Lord, we praise you for that, and we ask your forgiveness for our hard hearts and our ungratefulness. Lord, would you take us this week and cleanse us, make us right, remind us constantly that we have much to be thankful for, even the least of us. There's much to look around and say thank you, Lord, for. And so take us and turn us into a grateful people. May it become our habit to stop and say thank you, just as we teach our children to do with other people. May we stop and say thank you, Lord, for each thing. So, Lord, we're grateful for your forgiveness, for your mercy. And we ask that you make us like Jesus this week. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Psalm 103, verse 8, tells us that the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Let's stand again as we sing to our merciful God.
take your bulletin, we'll continue in our uh, reading of Psalm 119 for our affirmation of faith. Today we'll be in verses 113 through 120. And I'll begin reading, and then the congregation can read the text that's printed there in bold. I hate the double-minded, but I love your law. Depart from me, you evildoers, that I may keep the commandments of my God. Hold me up, that I may be safe and have regard for your statutes continually. All the wicked of the earth you discard like dross. Therefore, I love your testimonies. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are your people, and we boldly become before your throne. We come before your throne because we know that you love us, your love for us is everlasting and steadfast. You've provided for us a way of salvation, a way for our sins to be forgiven because of the sacrifice of your son. And so this morning we rejoice in forgiveness of sin that we have in Christ alone, through faith alone. We rejoice that the path to your throne is open for us to come at any time when we find ourselves burdened, we can come directly to you and bring our requests to you. When we find ourselves not knowing what to do, we can come to you and say, Lord, I don't know what to do. Lead me, help me. We can come to you because you are our shepherd. You promised to shepherd us, to lead us as your sheep. And so we trust you because we are often like sheep, going astray, like sheep with no understanding. And we need a shepherd. We need someone who can guide us, someone who can lift his head far above anything we can see and show us the way. So Lord, we come to you this morning as our shepherd, thankful that you see all things, you know all things, you care for us deeply. When we go astray, you seek us out and find us. When we're troubled, you comfort us. When we have a need, you provide. So Lord, this morning we come to you as a people with needs and we bring those needs to you. We have financial needs. Some of us don't know where we will find uh, finances even for the next week. Some of us are in need of a job and for employment. Some of us have burdens within our families, conflicts, family conflicts that we need you to work in. Some of us have children who have gone astray. We need you to work in their hearts. We need you to seek them out. We need your spirit to convict them. So all of these needs we bring to you because you are a God who is concerned about the needs of your people and you work for us, so we confidently bring them to you, knowing that you will work, you will answer our requests as we bring them to you. Lord, we live in a country that each day seems to be slipping further and further uh, from any kind of moral compass, and yet we are a people whose feet are grounded in your word, and so we bring our country to you Pray you would bring a, re a reviving work in this country, turning people's hearts again to God, turning them to you. Lord, that we would see true justice prevailing in this land. And Lord, we bring all the countries of the world to you, for you are the God who reigns. You reign over all things. We think especially this morning of the Chong people in Cambodia. We pray you would have mercy upon those people that your gospel would go forth with power among them and draw many to yourself. We pray for our missionaries, the farmers. We pray you would 
encourage them, strengthen them, give them increased faith in what you're doing in that country. As they prepare to return, you would give them wisdom to know what steps to take as they uh, uh, return in the coming months. Lord, for our people here, we pray especially for our congregation uh, in, that lives in liberty. We pray you'd strengthen them this week, that they would know uh, the comfort of your spirit, that as they spend time in your word, you would open their eyes to understand what, what you are trying to say to them through your word this week. Pray for the country of the Netherlands. Lord, there's been much gospel fruit coming from that land in the past. We pray there would be, in the future, a renewing of your church there, that the glories of the past would be returned, uh, especially among the churches there. Lord, you are a God of past, present, and future. You have sustained your church in the past. You're sustaining your church today, and we trust you to sustain it in the future. Pray for the many who are in countries that are persecuted, you would sustain the believers there, that they would know uh, the ministering of your spirit in their hearts, even today. Lord, this morning, as we come before your word, as our pastor brings it to us, we ask your spirit would be active here, convicting us of our sin, opening our eyes to the truths of your word, conforming us more and more to the image of our Savior. We ask that he be glorified in all things this morning, for we pray in his name. Amen. Our God is a shepherd, he is our sustainer, he is our salvation. Let's stand as we sing, the Lord is my salvation.
heard much about hope in both the psalm that we read together and in our singing, and I want that to be the theme of our study of God's Word this morning, the hope that is ours because Christ is risen. Find your way to 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 28. As we try to move from last week, what if, to this week, but since. As you're finding your place there, continue to be uh, reminded of praying for the Maglingers. We'll be over there this afternoon for a little bit of singing with Gary and Donna. When you think of somebody facing what is certainly to be a a quicker death than most of us are anticipating, at least aware of in our own lives, you do realize hope is a significant foundation of the Christian life. To sing of when I reach my final day, and to know that even though our bodies might wither up and stop working, as with ALS, until those nerves just stop having your organs function rightly, and you suffocate and die. How is there hope for that apart from our faith in Jesus? I just cry the whole time I'm trying to sing over there. So we're probably going to need a few extra voices. If you want to join us, uh, let me know. We can squeeze you in. We looked last week at verses 12 to 19. What if Christ has not been raised? Well, that's that's a bad thing. Our preaching is worthless. Our faith is worthless. We're all just lying to ourselves and others about the good news of Jesus. Even the people that we know that have died, they're, they're not in heaven. They're not in a better place. They're all accountable for their sin, and all of us are still stuck in our sin as well. Summary, verse 19. If all we have in this life is this faith in Christ, then we're a miserable lot of people. We should be pitied. But we're trying to move from that misery to our theme this morning, hope. So when verse 19 says, if all that were true, if the what if is true, then we're a miserable people. Verse 20, but in fact, or but since Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Since Christ has been raised, there is hope. We're not going to go down that path of despair and the what if Christ isn't raised from the dead. Instead, we're going to focus on what is true. What Paul had told us in the first paragraph, here's the gospel, that the God-man, Jesus Christ, came and kept the law perfectly so that you could have a righteous record of good works instead of your sinful record of failure. And then he died on the cross for your sins so that you could be forgiven. And then he rose from the dead so that you could have the hope of living forever with God. So all of that was the gospel that Paul said. Here it is in a nutshell. Now he's helped us see what happens if you take the resurrection out of that, if Christ hasn't been risen. Well, the gospel collapses, and so you're still in your sin and you're a miserable lot. But if that stays there, if the resurrection is true, if Christ has been raised, then the reality is that resurrection of Jesus, which we read about in Matthew 28, an angel sitting there on the stone telling the women and the disciples, hey, he's not here. He's risen just like he said. If that's the case, then that resurrection is a promise and a proof of every other resurrection to come. Because the Bible calls it the first fruits of a harvest. It's an anticipatory expression. Here's the first harvest that I've plucked, the first grains of wheat that I picked up as that farmer walking through my fields, rattling that chaff, and there it is. There's that grain of wheat, and he's looking out over hundreds of acres of it, realizing this first pluck 
is only a, a testimony of the vast harvest field to come. That resurrected body of Jesus says to everyone who puts faith in Jesus, you too will be raised from the death that makes up this earthly existence to everlasting life. Ours is a hope because Christ has risen. In that rare exception of the last paragraph, Paul lets us wander down the what if so that we could see the despair and the misery of having no hope of a future resurrection. But now we need to focus on the hope that is ours since Christ indeed has been raised from the dead. So what is the substance of this hope? What makes up our hope? That's what I want us to see. Four foundations, four pillars on which hope rests this morning. Number one, because Christ has been raised from the dead, we hope in our resurrection. Let's look at our text, beginning in verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For... As in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits. Then, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under His feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that He is accepted who put all things in subjection under Him. And when all things are subjected to Him, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him who put all things in subjection under Him, that God may be all in all. Our first hope is our hope in our own resurrection. Christ has been raised from the dead as the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Verse 23, each in his order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to him. Ours is a hope in resurrection. But what are we told about this resurrection? First, we're told that it's a resurrection from death. But if you're reading this for the first time, you could say, but I'm alive. I haven't died yet. Well, you have. See, the explanation follows. For as by a man came death, so by a man also comes the resurrection of the dead. Well, what are you talking about? By one man we died, by another man we're going to live. Further explanation, verse 21, or verse 22. For as in Adam... All die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, our resurrection is from this death that came by a man, more specifically by Adam. It's Genesis chapter 3. You could read in Romans 5 this week, there's a paragraph there, verses 12 through 19, that are going to echo this teaching in 1 Corinthians 15 in showing us that Adam, as the perfect man, as the first creation of God, without a sin nature, stood as the representative for all humanity. And when he rebels against God, all of us are in him doing the same thing. He's corporate. He's representative. And so in Adam, all sinned, and therefore in Adam, all died. Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15 are making that point, but you can see that story unfold in Genesis 3. Adam, as the representative of humanity, sinned, and so, in Adam, all humanity becomes guilty of sin and therefore warrants the consequence of death. The death sentence passed on every human because they're of Adam's nature. That's verses 21 and 22, the first half of the verse. By a man came death. That man was Adam. 
By his sinful choice, we're all guilty. And we tend to think, well, that's not fair. Like, I wouldn't have... No, you would have. That's the point. If Adam, as the perfect man, without a sin nature, chose to rebel against God as humanity, because that's all there was, then I assure you, you with your sinful nature have and will choose to disobey God. In Adam... All died because in Adam all sinned. But verses 21 and 22 also give us the rest of the story. Verse 21 is, death came by a man, and yet life also comes by a man. Now, just know that that's, that kind of sounds like almost a nickname. That, that's not the sum total of who Jesus is. We know that. He's not just a man. But he's not less than a man. He's not God and, oh, he's not man. He's something else. No, he is the God-man, remember. He is God come in the flesh. That's why the church still marks the calendar with Christmas. It's this mind-blowing thought of how God would condescend and take on human form so that when he was born of the Virgin Mary, he was really human. It's just that he was also God in his nature. So by this second man, or the second Adam, comes the hope of life, whereas the first Adam could only give us death. Verse 22 tells us, as in Adam all die, oh, not right away, nor did Adam and Eve just keel over dead in the garden, but they died because of the sentence of death that was on them. They were separated from God and now accountable for their sin and it was only a matter of time before they would die in that sin. So death is a right description of their condition. But verse 22 tells us, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Now we see this isn't just resurrection from the dead, though we need to understand that. Too often when it comes to understanding man's sinfulness, we don't realize that whatever you want to grant man in a choice or an ability, you have to go back to Genesis 3 to see when his choice was exercised. Because if we want to argue about man's free will, let's do so, but let's do so from Genesis 3. When with unrestrained by sin, he had the freedom to choose. And what did his choice lead him to? Rebellion, sin, rejection of God, independence. After that moment when sin and death passed upon all men, you can talk about freedom, but it's kind of like the animals at the zoo are free. They're free to roam around inside the caged walls they live in. So it is for humanity. If you, if you want to tell me they're free, I'm just going to say, yes, he's free within the bounds of sin. He's as free as his chains will let him walk before they snag him and he can't go any farther. He's free to do whatever sin wants him to do, but he's not free to seek after God. He's not free to repent. He's not free to believe. He's, because Romans 3 tells us no one will do that. Because they're busy enjoying their pseudo-freedom, which looks an awful lot like slavery. So when we sang this morning of my chains being gone, that's the celebration of Christ's work on behalf of sinners. It's something they can't do from them, for themselves. Ours is a resurrection from death and the bondage of sin, but it's also a resurrection to life that comes through Christ. In Christ, many shall be made alive. Nobody dead makes themselves alive. Christ has to do that. So if you're a believer in Jesus, you were once, Ephesians 2 says, dead in your sin. Christ made you alive. That's why our salvation starts with Him. He made us alive. And in that quickening I was able to repent and believe my responsibility before God because he tells me, if you don't repent, you'll perish. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But lest I would boast in my repenting and belief, we're told 
in passages like this, Christ made you alive. So rejoice in His work. He brought life to you. It's a resurrection from the dead. It's a resurrection to life. The second Adam succeeded where the first Adam failed. The first Adam failed. He didn't keep God's law. He was unrighteous, but the second Adam would be righteous. He would accomplish what the first Adam failed to do. And his accomplishment, like the first Adam's failure, would be representative. It would count for anyone who believes. Now we need to make a theological note here. In verse 22, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. So is every sinner, all who are in Adam, going to be in heaven because they're in Christ? Has there ever been anyone who has died that was not a Christian? Well, obviously. If we just go to the Bible, we see plenty of people who died in unbelief. And we see of Judas in Acts chapter 1 that he even went to his own place of judgment and accountability. So clearly, the text isn't saying that the first half of the verse, the all who are in Adam are identical to the all who are in Christ. Otherwise, we have what's called universalism. Watch Oprah Winfrey and you'll get a good taste of, you know what? We're all going to end up in the same place and it's all going to be good. A one-time evangelical, Rob Bell, in his book Love Wins, struck a chord with Oprah and now they're great friends. But he doesn't have the same gospel that he would have once proclaimed. Because now, in love wins, everybody will be in heaven. God's a God of love. He's not going to punish someone eternally. And yet the Bible tells us exactly the opposite. So, how do we avoid universalism when we read, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Well, we need some help in defining our all words. We have to be precise with the text. So notice two phrases, verse 22. As in Adam all die, so also, that's the similarity, that, that's the point of the text. Like Adam spread death, so also Christ will spread life. That's as far as it's similar, so also... That's something in common. The next words, in Christ. That's different. How is it different? Well, because the first all are in Adam. Somehow they relate to his nature. They're of the same stuff as him, and of course that makes sense. Adam and Eve then, every human born since then, are partakers of that nature. They're made of that same stuff. They are in Adam. It's called humanity. Well, just as death spread through all humanity because they're all of the same nature, so also there's something else that's going to spread by nature. But it's someone else's nature. It's not the first Adam's. It's the second. It's the nature of Christ. If you're in Adam, you can be guaranteed of this. Death. The consequence of sin. But if you are in Christ... You are also guaranteed, as surely as death is the guarantee for humanity, if you are in Christ, you too have a guarantee. But what is the rest of the verse? If you are in Christ, you shall all be made alive. But if you don't care about the nuance of what it means to be in Christ or in Adam, and just want to say all who died all are the same, all who live, you could be a universalist. But literature, the way the text is written, and the words, the verbal inspiration of the words being important are telling us, wait a minute. It's not just saying all who died equal all who live. It's saying all in Adam died. If you share his nature, you're going to face death. And all who are in Christ 
also have a promise. You'll share in his life. Verse 23, another phrase that we should note. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then, who is he going to make alive? Then, at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So to be in Christ is to belong to Christ. And obviously it begs the question that Paul doesn't answer here. Well, well, how do I get in Christ? Well, you move from over here being independent. I'll be righteous enough. I'll be good enough. To saying that's never going to work. Because God has said there's no one righteous. No, not one. I need a better report card than the one I'm bringing home that has F's on it. How did I do in lying, F? What about covetousness? You were at a D minus, but you failed again there and got an F. You know, you're all Fs. That's not going to work. You, you're a sinner then. And you're going to stand before God with, with a record that is failing, unfit for the perfection of heaven. So your only hope is to move from that independence thinking, I've done good enough to recognizing Christ is standing there offering His righteous record. 2 Corinthians, the next letter Paul would write to this church in chapter 5. He says, God made Christ who knew no sin. He has a perfect record. He made Him to become sin for us so that we could be made righteous. He took our sin, we get His perfect record. That's the only way to be in Christ, to belong to Him. And suddenly, that verse isn't universalism. It's just saying, as sure as death will pass upon everyone with a human nature, so certain will resurrection be for everyone who partakes of Christ's nature. And it's Peter who would tell us that we're partakers of the divine nature when we're in Christ. So this is good news. This is hope for us. It's a resurrection from death to life through Christ. And it's all about your nature. You've got the human nature which gets you death. But have you ever by faith partaken of Christ's nature? Finally, regarding this resurrection, see that it's, it's, it's hopeful because it's the rest of the harvest. It's a resurrection that starts with the first fruits and then moves to the harvest. Maybe you were thinking, why are we reading Leviticus and Numbers? When we're studying 1 Corinthians, it's because God chose to tell us that Christ was the first fruits of resurrection of which a harvest follows. When you study Leviticus and Numbers, you read, that when they planted their fields and are about to harvest, they were to take some of that grain. And you heard the measurements there and mix it with oil or something and then make a sacrifice. Yes, and so their first harvest wasn't hurry up and store this in the barn and let's get the rest of it. No, it was a reminder, wait a minute, God's behind all of this. And so the twofold measure of the first fruits Offering was one, consecrated all to God. It's all His. It grew up out of the dirt because God is God. So it's all His anyway. Why not offer Him some as a reminder to all of us that as we go out for these next weeks and harvest these fields, it's all God's. But the other element that God wanted them to know when they took that first fruits, that first basket of grapes, that first armful of wheat was to remind them that I'm holding this in my hands, but there's a lot more coming that I can't hold all at once. There is a vast harvest to come. So that's the lesson of the first fruits in Leviticus and Numbers. It's why the people were told, make this a holy day. When that grain is ready, when those grapes are ready, when that vegetables are ready, make that a celebratory day and pluck a couple of those harvested fruits and vegetables and wheats and, and stop the rest of the day. That's why it said no more ordinary work and, and set this day aside and remember God is taking care of us. Wake up the next day 
and work sun to sun. Harvest your fields, but on that first day, just stop and remember, you don't have to harvest today. What about, what about a storm blowing in tonight? What about it? Right now, today, you can look at the harvest and see God did that. So if a storm wipes it out and he told you not to work today and gather any more, it's because he can still take care of you if it got wiped out overnight. He wanted his people to stop and see that his promise is trustworthy. He will provide. It's the lesson of first fruits. Trust God. There's more to come. And so it is when we look at the empty tomb of Christ, we're supposed to remember there is a vast harvest of resurrections yet to come. There's hope. There's hope for us as we face death that that, that is just the entrance into the realization of our hope. That God will keep His promise and just as the psalmist said, he would not leave his son in the grave, but would raise him up to complete our salvation. He would be the first fruits, and after him would come harvest after harvest after harvest of souls resurrected to their bodies for everlasting life. And God wants us to be thinking that we're, we're not going to be resurrected into some spirit existence no, you can, you can enjoy your botany and your biology and your animals and your vegetables and everything else in heaven because it'll be a new heaven and a new earth that we inhabit with physical bodies. Perfect. There's hope, Paul is saying. Hope in our resurrection. But because Christ has been raised from the dead, there's also hope in Christ's reign. We hope in the fact that Christ sits at the right hand of God in power and authority. We hope that He is sovereign now. Not in some future reign, but in a current one. If you want to see Christ reigning on earth someday in, for a thousand years, so be it. But don't use Paul to explain your theology. Because he's going to tell us there comes a day when we're resurrected and we don't wait for some other time. No, look at our text. He's saying you're going to be resurrected, Christ the firstfruits, verse 23, at His coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end. Once He's gathered His people, He's giving the kingdom to the Father and saying it's complete. I've accomplished the mission. So our hope is that until that resurrection end of human existence and this life on earth, our hope is that Christ is reigning. But where do we see that? Because 24 is talking about the end when He delivers the kingdom to the Father. But what does verse 25 tell us? He must reign until then. He's reigning until all His enemies are His footstool. He's reigning until He's completed His dominance and hands the kingdom to the Father. He reigns until then. It's not that suddenly then he doesn't reign and things are chaos. No. By then he's put the final exclamation point on it. The good news for us is that we're hoping today in Christ's reign. Read Acts 2. God raised him from the dead and he ascends to heaven and sits down at the right hand of the Father as king. The kingdom is now. Christ reigns now. Our hope is though the nations rage and even our nation wants to self-implode morally, Christ reigns and He's advancing His kingdom through His church. And He tells us the gates of hell aren't going to stand against this. Why? Because Christ must reign. And it's interesting, our text in almost every translation I can find says Christ must reign and it makes our minds think future, but the verb is present. He must be reigning until... He's dominated everything. So our hope is not just that, oh, someday we'll be resurrected, new heaven and new earth. No, our hope is even now, until that day, while we're stuck in these bodies and we're groaning in all, with all of creation, Romans 8 says, our hope now is that Christ is still in charge. The victory is His. The present kingdom. It's now. He must be reigning. 
Hope later as well, but hope now in the reign of Christ. And when the boss tells you tomorrow, we've got to cut your job. You don't have to wait for Christ to reign someday. You can remember that now Jesus is in charge of everything. His kingdom is present. Further, his kingdom is not passive. He must reign until what? Until the defeat of all his enemies is manifest to everyone. Because right now, I would like to see the reign of Christ a little more evident in China. I'd like to see those that are evil and persecute the church in the Middle East taken out. I'd like to see no more Christians blown to bits by bombs. I'd really like the reign of Christ to be seen by everyone. Christ says, well, that's our hope. Because his kingdom is not a passive kingdom that is kind of bunkered down and trying to make it till God finally says that's enough. No, it's an advancing army. It, it's, it's not a bunch of untrained people hiding out in a fortress hoping to endure, trying to weather the siege. No, it's, it's the Navy SEALs. It's the Army Rangers. It's the, it's the best of the best, and they're advancing the kingdom. It's not a passive kingdom. It's active. Christ is reigning, and he's defeating which reminds us of a third hope. This kingdom, this reign of Christ, His sovereignty that we want to boast in, ultimately it will triumph over all His enemies. Our hope is in ultimate victory. Verse 24. Then comes the end when He delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule, every authority and power. So he wraps everything up after defeating his enemies. So let's put it in chronological order. He's going to defeat and destroy every rule, every authority, and every power, and then the end, he delivers the kingdom to the Father. So he must reign until the end, and we know that before the end, he's defeating every authority and every kingdom and every power. So the end is, there's no more fighting. There is no more resistance. There is no more rebellion. There is no more rejection of Christ as king. There is a culmination coming. So much so that even death, it says, is defeated. This great threat to sinners can no longer threaten those who are in Christ. You'll never look over your shoulder remembering that the wages of sin is death. Because even death has been defeated by this righteous reign of Christ and the resurrection of all those who are in Him. We are resurrected to a life without the possibility of death. That's what everlasting life is. So this is the culmination of God's redemptive plan. No more death, no more sin and rebellion happening that would warrant death. The battle is over. I know we think, we, we look back to the cross, and plenty of gospel song has spoken of the cross being the place of victory. It is finished. No more battle, no more war. And in a sense, that's true because that's where victory began. But that victory is ongoing and we'll finally see it all realized as will everyone else in this end. We could grab Philippians 2 and pull that right up next to 1 Corinthians 15 and see how it ends. Finally, because Christ has been raised from the dead, we hope in eternal worship. Verse 28. Again, you, you could read, there's, there's much there in verse 26, 27, even 28 about subjection. It's Psalm 110, the most quoted psalm in all the New Testament. Triumph, victory, Christ. God has put everything under Christ's feet. In other words, He sends Jesus on this mission of redemption. Save 
God's people, judge your enemies. God gives all that to Christ to carry out. Christ is doing that. Christ is going to accomplish that. And in verse 28, when all things are subjected to Him, to Christ, then the Son Himself will also be subjected to Him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under Him. So it's all of the Father that Christ is Lord and dominating, and the Son is going to say, I've carried out my commission that you sent me on, now here's the victory. And He gives it to the Father. And then the text says this, He'll be subjected, the Son will be, to the Father so that God may be all in all. Well, What does this mean? What does this mean for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to be equal in the Trinity and yet the, Father to put, or the Son to put Himself in subjection to the Father? Well, we know this. Jesus is always the God-man. That's not going to change. Jesus will always be the visible form of God that you can see. It's also true that He will always be the Lamb slain. When we read Revelation, we have no trouble finding the Lamb who was slain for sinners and singing of His worth. He's the Savior. He'll always be that. He'll always be Lord. He will always be the one to whom believer and unbeliever bows the knee. But, verse 28 is telling us His work, His subordinate role, not subordinate person, He's one with God the Father and the Spirit in the Trinity. But in role, He was given this task, the incarnation for the redemption of God's people and the judgment of His enemies. The role has been accomplished. He carried out His commission. And so now he comes back with his commission in subjection to the Father and says, it is done. And he hands that scepter of rule to the Father. But as a mental picture, I would suggest to you that he never releases it. Rather, the Godhead embraces this completion and now God, Father, Son, and Spirit are all in all. We no longer need the Savior specifically to accomplish a task or the Spirit to do His work of convicting uh, of judgment and righteousness and sin. No, now we've come to the end because there are no more lines to be drawn. The goats, the unbelievers, have been cast into their eternal judgment. Believers are in the eternal joy of the presence of not just Jesus or the Spirit or, God, or the Father, but of God. God, and God becomes all in all. And the way theologians have described this all in all is that we see the triune God first as the ultimate source of all things, especially in context, your salvation and your resurrection. Because when you're in heaven, in your glorified body, enjoying the fullness of God's presence, God will be all in all. You won't have to try to pinpoint the role of the Father, Son, or Spirit in your salvation and resurrection. It will all be of God. And secondly, all in all is not just ultimate source, but we see the triune God as the ultimate goal of all things. The ultimate goal. This is what Paul wrote of in chapter 10, when in the context of Christian liberty, he said, do all to the glory of God. When we see God is all in all, we're thinking, yes, he's the ultimate source of all things, for from him, Romans 11, are all things, but then also through him and to him are all things. He's the goal. He's the goal of all things. You say, well, what's the point of the Christian life when there's so much suffering? God. What's the point? Why, why do some Christians die? Why doesn't he just take us right to heaven? Well, let's start with God. Well, how can it be that some people are in eternal punishment? What is the point of that? God. He's all in all. 
And while our minds in our broken bodies, even as Christians, are going to struggle to grasp all things for the glory of God, in heaven it's going to make at least a little more sense to us. But verse 28, it's like a drawstring on our backpacks. You know, you pull that thing and it cinches that top down. It's kind of like all of time all of existence from Genesis 1 forward to Revelation, it all gets drawn to a conclusion where God is not just all in all to Himself, but He's all in all to all of those in heaven. In other words, we'll, we'll get it. And it'll be eternal worship. We won't have to muster up worship. You don't have to drag yourself out of bed and Though your heart might not feel like worship or your body might not feel like getting to Sunday worship. No, none of that anymore. It'll just be worship eternally. It'll just be what we do. And while we're supposed to do that on earth, we will do it then. So your botany and your animals and your vegetables and all those things that you love now, you're supposed to do all that to the glory of God. It's just that we don't often. We indulge ourselves too much and that sugar cane gets the best of us and we're chowing on candy and everything else and not doing it the way we should, get too caught up in maybe even health and fitness, and, it, and are we doing it to the glory of God? You see, in heaven we'll do all that stuff, but we'll do it out of pure worship. God will be all in all. Our great goal now is to try to do that a little better here on earth. So how can we carry on this week? How does this hope, this hope of our resurrection, the hope of Christ reigning even now, the hope of His ultimate victory over all the sin and misery of this world, our hope of worship, what does that mean for us now? What does this hope do for us? Well, just remember that because Christ has been raised from the dead, we too will be raised. So yours is the right to expect something more than you're experiencing in this life. When life is hard this week, let hope rush in and say, I know, frustrating, isn't it? Now you too, maybe for the first time, will we'll pray, even so come, Lord Jesus. I hate this. This is a mess. This needs to be fixed. She won't talk to me anymore. This relationship's broken. That body is failing. Hope says, I see it. But expect something more. We too will be raised with perfect bodies. Hope in Christ's reign. That nothing in your life this week is beyond the rule of Christ. His scepter is not so short that your circumstance is beyond his reach. He can't do anything about it. That's a hopeless view of Christ on a throne. So let hope ride in this week and mingle with our circumstances and remind us He's in charge. He's got this. I know your, your boat is being rocked. But at any moment, your Savior might say, peace, be still. And if He doesn't, it's because he's still standing in your boat with you, not saying that. So look to him. Our hope calls us to victory. We win. Someday every wrong will be made right. When Christ ends all rebellion. Philippians 2 that I mentioned matches with 1 Corinthians 15. Then comes the end. But as he said in Philippians, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See that same progression? The end. He puts an end to all authority and dominion and rule. Nobody stands against him, literally. Every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that not, it doesn't stop there. Just like 1 Corinthians 15, 28 doesn't stop with Jesus. Instead, he hands this all to the Father. So in Philippians 2, 
that Jesus Christ is Lord, but that's to the glory of God. Be encouraged. That day is coming. And let hope remind you that eternal worship is ours, but so is present worship. And like Job, you can worship God who seems to have just handed you turmoil and struggle and pain and suffering. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. For I know that when I am tried, I will come forth as gold. It will be to his glory. So ours is hope because we can worship. And the great plan of the Bible is that we would be worshipers now always in all things, so that heaven just kind of becomes the transition into a better worship. As one songwriter said, and we will worship. Worship. Forever in his presence we will sing. We will worship. Worship. An endless hallelujah to the King. So Father, give us hope today. Because this life is hard. And we will groan. And we're longing for the full payment of our redemption of which the Holy Spirit is the down payment. We long for more. Remind us in our longing that we are also fighting. We are advancing a kingdom. A kingdom that magnifies the glory of our Savior. Who has defeated sin and death and has risen from the dead. and Promises us that same everlasting life. Help us to press on this week. Our hope can seemingly slip away so easily. The devil is so good at poking holes in our hope and it just seems to slip away from us. Lord, this week would you anchor us in your word which guarantees our hope. There is no what if anymore. We have moved on to the reality of hope in a risen Savior. Give us faith to believe that you reign over all things in our lives, that you are working out your dominance in this world until the day we see you face to face. Keep us faithful until then, and we'll trust in your faithfulness until then. Strengthen us by this your word today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Men, you come, we'll worship by our giving and by our thoughts on this text or the song that we'll hear.
be praying for one another. There's a lot of partial families here today with sickness kind of infiltrating. Uh, also pray for Jordan Smith. He broke his arm yesterday in a soccer game, so we'll see his cast next week, hopefully. Um, and others who are ailing. And so pray for one another. There's a lot of needs. And maybe even after the service in a conversation, you'll make a note of how you can bear some kind of burden. Uh, use that time as God gives it to you. God bless you as you go in hope. Thank you.